All righty. Well, we're going to get started this evening. And I'm Nancy Howell, and I'm with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And welcome to our uh, members program speaker series. And yes, we, for those who joined in a little early, we have our bird quiz. Um, and we're going to go over some answers in just a little bit. But it's so nice to see everybody. And I hope everybody's doing well. Um, happy February 1st already. Uh, can't believe it. It's, it's crazy talk. Um, everything's moving so fast. Um, but yes, today is our, our members meeting and speaker series. Believe it or not, like I say, February 1st. And that's little old me, Nancy Howell. I'm the board, one of the board members. So again, welcome everybody. And let's go through these questions and, uh, and answers. Um, the first question was, you know, the sense of smell is used by which group of birds? Is it orioles and finches and thrushes, petrels, vultures, and shearwaters, ostrich, kiwi, and cassowary? The second mm -hmm. question, some birds can see an ultraviolet, the UV range, true or false? Third, hearing is best developed in which group of birds? Ducks, cranes, warblers, owls, or doves? And then the loudest bird in the world, horn screamer. And that's a good name for a bird. And there is such a bird. The white bell bird, which, you know, bells can be really loud. Emperor penguin, I would guess you probably have to be kind of loud when you're in the Antarctic and you got, you know, all kinds of other penguins around. Or the blue and gold macaw, which, you know, is, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of macaws, uh, but they are pretty doggone loud. So hopefully you did really well on this quiz. Let's see where our answers are. All right. So sense of smell used by which group of birds? Did you get it? Petrels, vultures, and shearwaters? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, I heard a lot of, oh. Well, we know turkey vultures got to have a good sense of smell. Uh, I mean, even John James Audubon tested that out. The petrel and the shearwater are two ocean birds that use their sense of smell to perhaps find food in the oceans as well as their nesting burrows. Uh, apparently they have lots of oil in them and they were hunted uh, for their oil. So they are oily birds and, and they probably use that sense of smell for a couple of reasons. The second question had to do with uh, birds seeing in the ultraviolet range. Yes, that is true. Um, some feathers uh, fluoresce under UV, and it has been sh shown that at least the European kestrel and probably the American kestrel can see the uh, urine trails of, of voles and mice uh, because that, again, it shows in UV light. So then there's probably several other things. All right. And I, this one, number three, I think was pretty doggone easy. Owls seem to have the best developed uh, sense of hearing, which makes sense. They're, they're primarily nocturnal and tests or studies with barn owls, putting them in completely darkened rooms, no light at all, putting in live prey uh, under leaves and stuff, and the owls honed in on those mice and caught them just by their sense of hearing. And who would have guessed it? It is the white bellbird that has, it has, is the loudest bird in the world. And I know we can put uh, a, a website um, in the chat if you would like to listen to the white bell bird, it is a tropical rainforest bird. Um, and it has this big dangly fleshy things. The male has the big dangly fleshy things uh, hanging from its beak. So that is not a worm. That is part of the bell birds uh, snood or whatever you may call it. Uh, but yeah, uh, apparently the, if a male white bellbird is calling. It is as if a female white bellbird is standing in front of a, a stereo uh, from a rock, uh, in, like a rock band sound. I mean, it is apparently very, very loud. 
So uh, if we can get that in the chat, that would be really, really cool. And then you can listen to it. Okay, we always like to have new members um, and our memberships begin at $20 and go all the way up to, well, whatever you would like. So um, really we can, we can send you our, our newsletter electronically or we can have you uh, get the newsletter uh, by mail. There is a little extra charge if you do get the print newsletter. Uh, payment may be made through PayPal or by check and our membership link is on the WC Audubon website, as you can see there. I do want to announce that the Spring Bird Walk series is returning. This is a series of bird walks. As you can see, they run six consecutive Sundays, uh, April um, 10th through May 15th this year. This is the 89th year that the Spring Bird Walk series is, is uh, going on. And there's a lot of data that has been collected. Now, not all the areas that have the bird walks um, have been going on for 89 years, but, but um, there have been checklists that have been turned in for, and, and lists of birds that have been turned in for a number of years in some of these sites. Um, Generally, the uh, walks start at, at 7.30 in the morning. There can be sites in what you can see, Cuyahoga, Geauga Lake, Medina, and Lorain County. So there's a lot of organizations that are involved, not just Audubon groups. Uh, Menor Marsh is, is involved, and the Lake County Metro Parks are involved, Medina County Metro Parks. So there's a lot, and I'm gonna show you the, the different sites in the next couple slides. Um, Western Cuyahoga area, um, well, we have a couple of areas that, that our hikes go uh, on. Lake Isaac in the Big Creek Reservation, of course, the Rocky River Nature Center and uh, the Rocky River Reservation, the Hinkley Reservation and Brexville. So those are four areas that cover our uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon areas. And of course, we watch for spring migrants. And we encourage anybody to join families, novices, people who've been birding for a long time. So we, we, uh, we really, really like sharing that information with everybody. So as I mentioned, uh, our area does cover the ones that are in yellow. So there's three here and there's a fourth on the next slide. So you can see um, the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, their Aurora Sanctuary, as well as they have the Novak Sanctuary, Bedford Reservation, Big Creek, that's the Lake Isaac, Brexville, uh, Gates Mills, they, you'd have to call to find, they have various locations. They do not do the same site every week. They have a whole different a uh, set of areas where they bird. Uh, the Geauga Park District, of course, in Hinkley Reservation, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Hiram College, uh, the James uh, H. Barrow Field Station has a set of walks. Holden Arboretum, Lake Metro Parks, the Lake Erie Bluffs Park. Uh, Lorain County, uh, they are doing Cascade Park in Elyria, and their walk starts at 8.30 in the morning. As I mentioned, Menor Marsh, North Chagrin, Novak Sanctuary, I, I mentioned. Um, the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation, that's a good one, too. I love that area. Uh, Rocky River, Shaker Lakes, so the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes. And in Medina, River Sticks Park. Now, rather than doing Sundays, they do the Saturdays of the uh, preceding the, our Sundays. So there's our April 9th through May 14th, again, at 7.30 in the morning. So there's a lot of different organizations and a lot of different walks. So we are so excited about getting back to uh, having our guests and members and participants because the last two years we've kind of put things on hold. Yes, this lead, is an awareness test. Yes, leaders went out and and did surveys uh, or did the walks. Sometimes others would join us. However, um, we 
really, really are encouraging visitors this year. Alrighty, Michelle, one of our board members and field trip co-coordinators. Co Michelle, take it away. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Brocious. I'm a board member and field trip co-coordinator. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I'm going to be uh, reviewing Second Saturday Bird Walks and the report, uh, announce the virtual field trips, a Tremont towpath, urban bird walks, and uh, social media. Next slide, please. All right, so please join us on February 12th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We meet at this location and time every second Saturday of the month, usually between the upper and lower parking lots, and then we take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Gresskemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. Next slide, please. All right, so this past second Saturday was held on January 11th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, on the second Saturday of the month bird walk for January 2022, we were joined by the Kirtland Bird Club for a combined bird walk. 19 birders braved the cold January weather. The temperature started at 17 degrees and finished with the temperature at 24 degrees. Sunshine, blue skies, and a slight breeze accompanied us the entire walk. The group ended up with 25 species. We were treated to several tree sparrows. We had great looks at a pair of pileated woodpeckers. Four bluebirds were putting on a show for us. The male bluebirds were glowing in the sunshine. We had a constant flow of Canada geese, totally 96 flyovers. A sharp shin hawk appeared to be following slash chasing a bald eagle. The barred owl was perched high in the pine trees for some great viewing. And there's a photo of that barred owl by Sean Missig on the left side of the screen. All right, next, thank you. All right, so the January virtual field trip. Last month, our virtual field trip was held at West Creek Reservation. Our target species were the hawks and bluebirds. Uh, the virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird lists takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place on February 9th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, please do so by this Friday so that I can get your items into the scrapbook. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the reservation last month, you're still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Uh, if you're a member or um, on our email list, you'll receive the Zoom link in one of our weekly emails. Yeah, I'm gonna butt in here, Michelle. I'm mm -hmm. gonna just again reiterate, if you have not gone on the field virtual field trip, still come to these, these uh, uh, wrap ups or meetups. They're so fun to hear what other people say uh, and, and have seen. Uh, the photos are wonderful. So really, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. And then you'll say, oh, I'm gonna go on the next month's virtual field trip. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. All right. So this month, the virtual field trip takes place at Rocky River Reservation in search of northern cardinals and tufted titmice. I have listed several sites I think might be good. The Rocky River Nature Center trails, Lewis Road Riding Ring, Lagoon Picnic Area, any picnic area on Valley Parkway, and the all-purpose trail along Valley Parkway offers a lovely walk for those with accessibility needs. However, you can visit any site in the reservation. During your visit to the reservation, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. Wonderful. You can get that you can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, um, clicking the field trips tile and then field trip reports 2022. And uh, of course, I think information will also be in a weekly email. All right, next slide, please. All right, the Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walks. So after a brief pause, the Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walks are back on the schedule. We meet the fourth Saturday of each month through October at 9 a.m. at the Cleveland Metro Parks Towpath parking lot off Abbey Avenue. It is an easy walk in an urban setting. A last month's Tremont walk took place on January 22nd, during which four brave birders counted 24 species. I'm saying brave because I think that was a really cold day. 
Um, notable species included northern pintail, lesser scalp, buffalo head, ruddy duck, American coot, bald eagle, and peregrine falcon. And there's a photo of a white throated sparrow um, that was also seen at the walk by Sean Missig on the left hand side there. All right, next slide, please. And finally, follow us on social media. Uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. I believe that's it for me. Thank thanks, you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. Um, now we've also have a book discussion series and Drina Nemes is here to share information with us. So Drina, are you there? I am here. Wonderful. Yes. Um, good evening. Um, we just had our last week, we had our uh, second book discussion of the season. And our next one will be April. And the date is not there. I'm sorry. It's April 26th. And we're reading a uh, book called The Feather Thief by Kirk Wallace Johnson. And it is actually a true story. And it's quite exciting. And uh, I just checked today in the Cuyahoga County Library System and there, there are several copies at various libraries. So if that is, uh, an, if you'd like to seek out the library uh, as your source, they're there. Also electronically, um, an audio version as well as electronic. Um, and if you go to the, Audubon, our uh, local chapter Audubon website, you can register, register there. And if you, you can see the book club tile, click that tile and it will take you to uh, getting registered. Next slide, please. And I just wanna uh, mention again about Rachel Carson. We uh, talked about Silent Spring last week. And um, this is the 60th anniversary of the publishing of that book. And it seems like such a timely um, moment to, to uh, read that book again and see and, and read about all the amazing things that Rachel Carson did for us and for our planet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Drina. Um, I just want to mention there were several people at the last book discussion uh, on Silent Spring, and Drina had some very, very interesting questions for us uh, to discuss. Um, one of them, you know, what would Rachel Carson think about things happening today? You know, think about the plastics that we have in our environment. Uh, Rachel Carson was a, a marine biologist, and I'm sure she would have uh, a lot to say. Uh, certainly, we're thinking about global climate change, too. So it's, uh, again, it was a, it's a very, very timely book, uh, even though her uh, writings dealt with the, uh, pesticides. Um, but today, we still have other concerns with the environment. All right, well, we still have a couple more slides to go through, first of all. Uh, we want to mention we still have a couple things that we sell at our, our uh, store on the website. And one thing is, is tilth soil. And this is produced from composted uh, food waste by Rust Belt Riders, which is a Cleveland company. And they have different types of soil. You can have soil that for house plants called house soil. Um, you have sprout soil, which is good for um, really, there it's all purpose, but it's really good for starting seedlings. And you know, spring is coming. So, and then they have a, a third type called grow, which is again good for gardening outside and amending your soil. So, it's uh, again keeps a lot of food waste and waste materials from uh, landfills. And it's uh, again just a really, really wonderful company. Um, so again, check out the 
uh, homepage button and our store and see if you'd like to uh, purchase some. I have a little bit on, uh, on hand right now. I have one bag of the sprout soil and uh, which is like the smaller bag pictured there and two of the house plant uh, soil again, just like the smaller bag pictured. And I can get that to you tomorrow. And of course, we all like ice cream, no matter if it's winter or summer. And so we have a few of the Mitchell's homemade ice cream gift cards. Um, they are $10 denominations and you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. Wouldn't you like your favorite Valentine's to have a, a Mitchell's homemade ice cream gift card? So just let us know. You can check out the, the store and or send us an email at info at WC Audubon. And again, we can get that gift card to you real quickly. I'm not sure, is Amanda joining us this evening? I saw her this, this morning and I didn't get a chance to ask her if she was going to be with us this evening, but we also uh, do sell Birds and Beans Coffee, which is the only brand that is 100% certified Smithsonian shade grown bird friendly coffee. That's a lot of to say. Oh, and by the way, don't let your cockatoos drink coffee. I'm not sure if that's really good for them. Um, right now, in my hands, I have five pound bags of dark roast whole bean coffee for $50. That means you are saving uh, about two, about three dollars. Um, and I can deliver that in a day or so. Um, or if you would like to get some of the other varieties of coffee, you can order uh, decaf, you can order dark roast, you can order fine grind, you can medium grind, again, on our homepage. But get your order in by February 10th. We send the order in on February 11th. And usually within about three to five days, we get our order and can have that to you in your hands. We will deliver. So we hope that you will think about uh, getting some of these birds and beans coffee. I hear from folks that it's a fabulous coffee. I'm not much of a coffee drinker, but this is a really, really good coffee. Alrighty. Well, I want to just mention next month, uh, one of our members, Tim Colbert, uh, who is an excellent birder. He's also the president of Ohio Ornithological Society. He is going to be speaking on grassland birding in Colorado and Saskatchewan. I guess when he retired, he gave that as a gift to himself. So I can't wait to see some of the grassland birds from out west and to hear what Tim has to say. But this evening, we are going to be uh, greeted by Dr. Sarah Maybe, who's a professor of biology at Hiram College. And uh, she will be speaking on you know, the sensory world of birds. And I think everybody knows a bit about, you know, what bird senses are the best. You know, we think about sight and hearing, but I think we're also going to be um, Appreciate, appreciating the other senses that birds have as well. So I am going to stop sharing. It is really an honor to be here with you all tonight. And I appreciate the opportunity to join fellow bird lovers and share some information about bird sensory perception. And I'm gonna share my screen and my hope is that I'll be able to share my screen so you can see what I wanna present and I can still see my notes. That's the hope. <laughs> Except the host has disabled screen sharing, oh. so. You on it, Nancy. If you go to the participants list and yep. click on more, it, there should be an option. I don't have it as a co-host. Yep, yep. 
first. I have to find you in all of our list. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, more. There you are. So you might be able to make her a co-host. Yeah, so I'm going to okay. do. Okay. All right, your co-host. Okay. All right, you can see my screen. Wonderful. I can't see my notes, but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is this is what we do. We just make do. Um, so again, I just want to thank you. I love talking about how amazing birds are, and it's delightful to have an audience that is receptive. Um, so I'm just going to um, start with a little video. Can you also hear the video? Okay, good. And um, you may be familiar with these ridiculous little birds, these little mannequins here displaying for a female we have two males doing these remarkable dances making remarkable noises and the female using all of this information from the males to make a very important decision in her life and that is the decision of who will um, she share parenting with for her offspring and um, clearly one of life's most critical decisions. The reason I share this video is because there's so much going on here and she is processing information very quickly in order to make a really important decision. And it's that information processing that I want to talk about this evening. So with that little um, reminder of how remarkable birds are, I just want to start by giving you a little foreshadowing of what I'll be talking about this evening. So of course, we all know this, birds are smart. And that is the backdrop to my talk this evening. Um, throughout, I think we'll see all of the different ways that birds are so incredibly smart. The other major point of my talk is that information is power, just as that um, little mannequin female was assessing information about the males that were performing for her, um, she's gathering information so that she can make an important decision. Information is key here. And of course, all animals are assessing and processing information from the environment at all times. We know, and Nancy highlighted, that birds are really visual creatures. And this is one of their dominant uh, sensory modalities, but it is not their only sensory modality. And I will talk about vision, but I'm also going to talk about sense of smell, which is fascinating to me and a terribly overlooked sense um, of birds. And if time allows, I'd like to talk about some of the mysterious sensory perception capabilities that birds have. So their ability to pick up polarized light, their ability to sense magnetic fields, and 
um, their ability to sense barometric pressure. The one thing I'm not really going to talk about tonight is sound signals and sound processing. This is something that we could really spend weeks on. And so I'm just going to set it aside for this evening. So how smart are birds? Well, I'm sure that you all have lots of your own favorite stories about how smart birds are. But these are some of the things that really blow my mind every time I think about them and put poor humans to shame in comparison. So birds can grow new synapses to enhance memory and chickadees can do this on a seasonal basis. So every year they can grow new connections in their brains so that their memory is improved. They can recognize the difference between human-made and natural objects. Even scrub jays can plan for the future. Of course, they can use tools, meta tools, they can lie, they can put half their brains to sleep, which is the skill that I am most envious of. They have episodic memory. Um, and of course, they navigate across hemispheres and teach and learn from each other. I'm going to talk just a little bit about this uh, special intelligence that birds have that was um, discovered not very long ago, a little over a decade ago. And that is the intelligence to recognize self. And what's exciting about this recognition um, is that we used to think very recently, maybe a couple of decades ago, we used to think that only humans had this power of self-recognition and non-human primates could recognize self. But back in 2008, a um, couple of uh, German scientists discovered that magpies can actually recognize self. And they did this very clever experiment where they put a little yellow dot on the breast of a magpie and put the magpie in front of a mirror. Now, if you put a kitten in front of a mirror, the kitten would look behind the mirror thinking that's where the action is. Behind the mirror, there must be another kitten back there. You put a magpie in front of a mirror and you put a little yellow dot on the magpie, the magpie does not peck at the mirror to get the dot off the mirror or off the other magpie. The magpie begins to preen itself, recognizing that what it is seeing is itself and that it has something on itself that it doesn't want to have on itself, which I think is just amazing. So it's this kind of intelligence that birds have that, um, I am, why am I, that makes, um, makes them so fascinating. And all of this intelligence is of course mediated by their sensory perception. We all know as birders and bird watchers that it's nearly impossible to sneak up on a bird. They will detect you long before you detect them. At this time of year, well, lately I've been doing a lot of cross country skiing and the, um, the most common thing for me when I look up is to see a raptor flying away from me in the distance. I've been perfectly quiet. I'm not singing or anything. That raptor is gone. Um, these are just some of the ways that we know how well birds 
can detect information in the environment. So despite our deep fascination with birds, we really um, have long underestimated their cognitive abilities. And again, a fairly recent discovery is that birds' brains are built much more like human brains than we ever thought. So in the early 2000s, a group of researchers started working on understanding the brain. Previously, you see here at the top of the screen that um, the bird brain here on the left, we thought was mostly comprised of instinctual basic uh, tissues and cells. So not processing cells, not sophisticated synapse, but this very basic um, brain material. A reconstruction and a reanalysis of bird brain tissue shows that in fact, in this modern view, the pallial tissue of the brain, this is the tissue that is responsible for the highest level of cognitive processing, is in fact the largest part of the bird brain. So a very recent, um, completely revolutionary upheaval of our understanding of the avian brain. So that now we know from an anatomical perspective and a physiological perspective that their brains have this high capacity for processing information. So why have all of this incredible uh, intelligence? It seems that for all organisms, the ability to pick up the right kind of information, to process that information, is part of our need to survive and reproduce. And I would say that all organisms share the same basic needs. We have basic problems that we have to solve, finding food and water, shelter and safety, mating and forming social bonds. And detecting and using information is critical to solving those problems. One of the fascinating things is that sensory perception is a lot about what we block out. Information is everywhere and not all information is relevant. So it's not just about having the acuity to pick up information, it's also about having the processing power to block out what is unimportant. Just as we block out what is unimportant, we're also able to fill in the blanks. And of course, birds are able to do this as well. Sometimes our senses trick us so that what we see is not really what's there. And I don't know how well this shows up on Zoom, but if you stare at this figure on your screen, do you see uh, gray circles flashing on and off in the intersections between the squares? Those are not really there. Those are your eyes playing tricks on you. And no matter how many times I say, 
those circles aren't there, there's nothing flashing on your screen, your brain is still going to see those circles flashing on the screen. So there are times when our brains can't override our sensory perception. So we're gonna do a little um, awareness test here. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! How many passes did you count? Just unmute yourselves or drop something in the chat. How many did you count? 12, that's good. 13, great, that's close. 12, 13, excellent, 10. Okay, this is kind of like counting uh, ducks out on the lake, right? Not entirely sure, but we're all in the same ballpark. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! <laughs> this is exactly our minds processing the information that we think is important and blocking out the information that we don't think that we need. That is the biggest challenge for all living organisms. There is information everywhere. So we're gonna talk some more about how birds detect, filter, and make meaning out of all of this information. So first, from a scientific perspective, we need to ask, how do we know what other animals perceive, right? Our perception is so different from that of other animals that we can't just interpret what they see, what they hear, what they detect based on our own capabilities. So we have to go out and actually measure their sense organ capacity, what on a physiological, on a cellular level, on an anatomical level, are they able to detect? What is their capacity for detection? And then we also have to find some way of measuring their neurological, physiological, and behavioral responses to stimuli. So if we take another look, a different look at the avian brain, we're gonna look at some of the different areas of the brain that tell us a lot about what birds are capable of detecting. And so if we look at the brain, we can see here that all birds have an olfactory bulb that allows them to detect smell. They have optic lobes for processing visual information. And then the cerebral hemisphere, this is where we would find sound processing and sound production areas of the brain. Just by looking at the bird's brain, we can see that the birds dedicate a lot of tissue space, a lot of real estate to optical visual information. So the optic lobe is very well developed in all birds. 
And the olfactory lobes differ from species to species, from family to family. How much um, real estate is dedicated to processing and detecting uh, sense, uh, chemical cues from the environment. So just to um, point out again, this is where sound processing occurs and occurs pretty deep in, in the brain. Sorry, I'm having a little mouse issue here. So if we're gonna focus on the eyes because birds dedicate so much of their brain capacity to visual processing, um, let's think a little bit about what this visual processing um, looks like from a bird's perspective. And I love this quote. Does anyone out there speak French? I'm, I'm seeing some no's. Um, this essentially tells us a bird is a wing guided by an eye, which is just a beautiful way of thinking about a bird's experience. So let's see if we can um, put ourselves up against a bird's experience. And here um, in this beautiful forest, let's imagine ourselves as Acadian flycatchers sitting on a branch, waiting for some small flying insect to pass us by just the right time just uh, the right distance so that we can catch it and eat it. And I'm going to um, put you up against that Acadian flycatcher. There's a fly in this picture. And in a minute, it's going to move. And I'm going to ask you if you can follow it and if you could capture it. Would you be able to catch that? No, certainly not. Let's make this a little easier on ourselves. Let's put out something more like a tennis ball out there in the forest. And I still want you to think, can I follow this? Could I mobilize my body to move out and catch it in midair? Still no, but imagine we've all watched in awe as any flycatcher, a Phoebe, a Peewee, an Acadian flycatcher, a kingbird goes out and grabs that thing in midair. That's a lot of processing. I would say that tennis players and baseball players, probably the closest we come as humans to being trained well enough to do what a flycatcher does. So what's going on here in the eye that makes bird's vision so great? Um, a bird's eye is recognizably familiar. It's very much like our own. It's got a lens for focusing, uh, an iris, and um, muscles. It has a retina here and an optic nerve. It has fovea for um, further focusing visual information, but it's got some different things in it. And one of those different things is this little structure right here, which is called the pectin. And um, researchers are still trying to figure out exactly how the pectin functions and exactly what it does. But the thinking is that the pectin delivers oxygen 
to the eye. What bird's eyes don't have is a lost, lot of um, small capillaries on the back of the eye. Our eyes have capillaries on the back behind the retina. And if you press your eye against the palm of your hand, you might begin to see red. And that is because you have all of those capillaries in your eye and birds don't. And the thinking is that even those little capillaries could interfere with acuity and precision of vision. So another difference is that um, birds have really high density of cones in their eyes, which um, further improves acuity and precision of their vision. The rule of thumb is that birds' visual acuity is about seven times greater than our own, which would help explain what's going on with that flycatcher as opposed to us and our limited visual abilities. But another really interesting difference with the avian eye is the um, the fact that many birds, not all, but many have two fovea. And by having these two areas for um, focusing visual information, birds can actually have a broader field of vision with greater focus than we can. And then of course, um, some of our nocturnal birds also have at the back of the eye a special um, a special layer of tissues called the tapatum lucidum, which means basically the bright carpet of the eye, which is reflective uh, cellular material tissue that captures light and then sends it back into the eye to give the retina a better opportunity to process the information in dark conditions. And then finally, one of the other major differences between bird's eyes and human eyes is that birds are tetrachromatic. We only are trichromatic, so we see um, we see color in three peak areas. Birds see color in four peak areas. And what is unusual is this fourth, very, um, it's near ultraviolet ability that birds have. So we can't even imagine the color landscape that birds experience. These um, particular cells are really interesting as well. So they have these doublet cones and humans don't have these doublet cones. Researchers have been looking at these doublet cones and are finding some suggestion that these doublets may be partially responsible for birds' ability to see polarized light and magnetic fields, which is really exciting. Um, so what we know and what we yet have to learn about avian eyes is a great reminder that things aren't always what they seem. And this uh, is something that's really important for biologists to remember. In fact, the UV capacity of birds wasn't discovered until the 1980s. And um, when researchers started noticing this in fish, and in birds. So this um, 
wasn't really understood until the 1980s. So that's not that long ago from a science perspective. Um, so what do birds see? Birds see the world in a totally different way because of this fourth dimension, if you will, in their color perception. And so how do they use this ability to see UV light? And um, Nancy gave us a little preview of some of these great uh, ways that birds use UV light. So in terms of food location, and Nancy mentioned the kestrels that use uh, UV light to find mice, but birds use UV light for a lot of other reasons as well. Parental care, food choice, so not just finding food, but making choices between different kinds of food, mate selection, and recognition. This is a very well-studied area of UV uh, perception. Nest host selection. So if you are a brood parasite, like a European cuckoo, then you might use UV light to find the right kind of nest. So European cuckoos as nest parasites are a little more picky than our brown-headed cowbirds. Our brown-headed cowbirds, as far as we know, will drop their eggs anywhere. But cuckoos learn from um, experience, and this seems to be passed down. It's either genetic or from experience, but they have a preference for the species that they themselves were raised by. So UV light seems to be one of the ways that they identify which nests are preferable. And of course, predator avoidance is a possibility and new nest and roost site recognition is something that researchers are looking into. So let's just take a couple of examples here and look at them. I love this, um, I love starlings. I know that's an unpopular view. <laughs> But when I was an undergraduate and I didn't know anything about birds, I saw these beautiful birds on my campus and I was fascinated by them. And I went and I described to my uh, professor, these beautiful birds, they're shiny and they're pink and they're blue and they're, and he was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and of course, later I learned they were just starlings. And when I worked in Europe, um, European ornithologists I worked with said that they would happily exchange all of our starlings for all of their Canada geese. So <laughs> um, the starling is good luck in Europe. And I, I always keep that in mind. At any rate, very clever birds, extremely stinky, you do not want to get into a starling nest because you'll have to burn your clothes. But both starlings and alpine swifts alter their feeding intensity in response to the UV reflectance of their nestlings gape. So the gape, of course, is this bright super signal for feed me, I'm hungry. And, um, in the early part of the nestling period, Biz and colleagues have shown that the stronger the UV reflectance in the gape, the, so I'm sorry, let me put it this way. The UV reflectance of the gape correlates reliably with the condition of the offspring in the nest. And so parents choose to feed early during the nestling period those starlings 
that are in the worst condition. And later, when the nestlings are getting ready to leave the nest, they switch their strategy and they begin really spoiling the strong nestlings. So it's as if their strategy is to try to get the weaker nestlings to catch up in the beginning. But in the end, they're investing more in the strongest. And they're using UV reflectance of the gape to make those decisions. And then, of course, this is what Nancy was talking about. I love this, too. It's like the N NCIS of the bird world. Um, if you watch any of these crime shows on TV, they're always running around with the UV light because the UV light picks up biological fluids. And that's exactly what these kestrels are doing. It's as if they're flying around with this UV detector looking for biological fluids. And of course, small mammals on their little routes through the field are urinating all the time because they want the information that's provided by urine. It helps them keep on track. It helps them mark their territories. But by urinating in the fields, they create these lines, these mazes of, of urine tracts that Kessler's, Kestrels can pick up. And the thinking here is that the higher the density of those urine tracts in the field, the more likely it is that this is a good place to stop and have lunch. And finally, about UV perception in birds, we're still learning so much more about how birds use this information. So UV reflectance in feathers is primarily structural, and it may be a very important source of information in monomorphic species. This is something that I really love because I have a, I have a fondness for monomorphic species, those in which the male and female look identical. And I'm not sure why I like these birds so much, but this was, I built my whole dissertation around uh, monomorphic species. Like I just wanted to study a monomorphic species. That's not really true, but it's part of it. And um, I studied spotted flycatchers, which are European bird, the dullest little brown and white bird you could ever imagine. And when I was in Italy and in Sweden studying these birds, all the time I was saying to my European colleagues, these birds are pink. I swear, these birds are pink. And they would tease me and they would say, oh, put on your sunglasses. We got another spotted flycatcher. Um, and then later I learned that in some of these really dull looking monomorphic species like this saw wet owl here, under UV light, their feathers glow pink. <laughs> um, and that this is an area that is rich for future research. Our birds using UV reflectance to gain information about age, about sex and things, information that is hidden from us. And finally, about vision, we're coming full circle. So Darwin, when he, after he had written um, on the origin of the species, he recognized that there were still some things that were mysterious to him about evolution through natural selection. 
And one of them had to do with the ornamentation of male birds. Why were male birds so beautiful? And he was um, writing in his diary about peacocks. And he wrote, the sight of a peacock makes me sick. Because he couldn't understand how that fabulous tail of a peacock could improve its chances of survival. Over the 12 years between writing and publishing on the origin of the species and writing and publishing um, The Descent of Man and uh, Sexual Selection, Darwin began to think about these ornamentations as being sexual signals. So that females would be choosing and driving, if you will, the selection of these traits in males. And Darwin was very practical in his writing, his public writing, so that he said that, you know, being able to reproduce well was certainly a valuable thing to pass on. In private, he thought a lot more about the ways that beauty might exist just for beauty's sake. And in recent years, ornithologists and evolutionary biologists have begun to revisit this idea that other animals may have aesthetic sensibilities that drive their choices in mates. And that's a very interesting and controversial area of research right now. We talked a bit about Rachel Carson earlier in your book club, and she was another really prescient thinker, someone who is so important. So she wrote, for the sense of smell, almost more than any other, has the power to recall memories and it is a pity that we use it so little. I think we've all had this experience where we smell something and it triggers in us a memory. This is a very exciting area of research in humans and in other animals, the connection between smell and memory. It turns out that smell is a very important sense and it is one that we actually tend to avoid using as humans and one that we have undercounted in birds as well. So again, going back to the bird brain and thinking about the real estate that is dedicated to sensory perception, we have here um, four different species of birds and their brains. OB is the olfactory bulb, and um, ON is the optic nerve. Um, and so we can, we can see different parts of the brain here. But what I want to draw your attention to is the size of the olfactory bulb in these different brains, the relative size um, of the olfactory bulb. So in the kiwi, which you know is foraging in the ground and, and seeking its prey underneath the soil, the kiwi has a very enlarged olfactory bulb compared to an emu, which has a relatively small olfactory bulb. Um, the barn owl here, also quite small. And the rock pigeon, which is interesting because it's thought that pigeons use sense of smell for navigation purposes. But this is just to remind us that not all bird brains are made equal when it comes to the ability to detect smell. So we know that this ratio of the olfactory bulb to the cerebrum varies across across different species, as well as their sensitivity to
to detecting chemicals in the air. So the detection threshold is measured in parts per million. So if we had here um, 10 parts per million and what the Cleveland, greater Cleveland area has something like 2 million people in the greater Cleveland metropolitan area, it would be like being able to detect 20 individuals out of 2 million. But down here, we're talking about detecting less than um, one person in a million. So this is really high sensitivity. And here we have those Procelleriformes, the seabirds, with um, a very sensitive detection threshold and a very large olfactory bulb relative to their overall brain size. So how do birds use smell? It's surprising because it's not all about food. So they can use smell for learned food choices. And this has been shown in goslings and in chickens. This is, this is really fascinating to me because what the mother eats is what the offspring, what the mother eats when she produces her eggs is what the offspring prefer when they hatch. And that seems to be mediated by these volatile chemicals in different foods. So nest material selection, food location, of course, and we've seen that and seabirds are great at using their smell to locate food, mate selection and recognition, nest and roost site recognition, and even kin recognition. And I love this too. Um, humans don't talk about smell very much, but I'll bet you, you, if you smelled another human being that smelled like someone in your family, you would know it. You might not talk about it, but you would probably know it. <laughs> um, so the tube nose seabirds, these um, Priscilla formes, were the kind of go-to birds for earlier discoveries of how incredible sense of smell is in some birds. So the chemoreceptive cells covering the internal folds of the noses, noses, if you will, of <laughs> these seabirds is really the very dense chemoreceptors and then a relatively large olfactory bulb. These seabirds are using, as Nancy pointed out, they're picking up on food in the ocean. And what they're picking up on is this dimethyl sulfide that is released from zooplankton in the ocean. And the zooplankton aren't the food, but the zooplankton are the food of the fish that the birds are interested in. And I want just to spend a moment, I want you to imagine flying over vast oceans and these birds travel hundreds, if not thousands of miles on their foraging trips. They travel far. And they are flying over an ocean, looking down, trying to find food that is below the surface. And one way they can increase their chances of finding food is by following the smell of dimethyl sulfide to find the concentrations of zooplankton and concentrations of fish. And Nancy pointed out how oily these birds are. The zooplankton is also oily. Dimethyl sulfide is oily. And there may also be a UV light signal at the surface 
of the water with these oil slicks. So pretty cool. More recently, we're discovering that even smaller birds are using smell to find food. And this is a really interesting uh, story here. So apple trees are one of many plants that um, release volatile chemicals when their leaves are damaged. And <clears throat> this may be a defense mechanism on the part of the plant that when its leaf is damaged from an herbivore, like this caterpillar here, is releasing volatile chemicals to scare off or discourage those caterpillars. But it turns out that these uh, great tits can detect those volatile chemicals that the tree produces when caterpillars are eating on the tree. And those great tits are preferentially attracted to trees that are releasing these volatile chemicals. And again, it's the same thing as with the seabirds. We have birds looking for small food items and they're increasing their chances by visiting trees that are releasing these volatile chemicals. It's just amazing. We um, are discovering that birds are using smell to potentially um, keep predators at bay. I mean, that's nothing new um, that nasty smells uh, get everyone running. But uh, Pareo and others working in Spain with the European roller, this beautiful bird here, um, had observed, many people had observed, that when nestlings were disturbed in their nest, particularly if they are touched in their nest, they vomit. And that the vomit is really smelly and unpleasant. And they wondered what was up with that vomit? Was it a predator avoidance mechanism? And if it was a predator avoidance mechanism, they wondered what do the parents do in response to the smell of their young's vomit. So they did this clever experiment where they made a mist, a spray of roller vomit and a spray of basically lemon water. So they had two different uh, experiments here going on and they sprayed, they sprayed vomit on the nest and the nestlings and watched what the parents did. And they sprayed lemon on the nestlings and watched what the parents did. And the parents didn't mind anything about the lemon um, smell, but when the parents visited the nest that smelled like vomit, they left. They left and they didn't come back for a really long time. They smell their nestlings fear and they run and they hide. <laughs> and we can see this here. Um, so the latency to return to the nest, if they smell lemon is very low. The latency to return to the nest if they smell vomit is significantly higher. And then we talked about kin recognition. Um, I thought this was fascinating work as well from Caspers and colleagues um, working with zebra finches. And they did 
um, these experiments where they exposed the zebra finch offspring to a scent of the mother or the fathers, and then presented them with the scent of um, zebra finches that they weren't related to. And they could do this by they capture the scent by putting the birds in a sock. And I don't know, it's very complicated, but <laughs> they can take a little puff of air that carries the scent of either the mother, the father, or a stranger. And the zebra finch offspring, the babies, begin to beg when they smell their mothers, when they smell their fathers, but they don't beg when they smell strangers. They, they took this uh, even farther and they did a little cross rearing experiment. And they took the eggs from one female and put them with another female. And so they basically switched the eggs before hatching. And then they ran this experiment one more time so that they exposed the young to the smell of the birth mother and the smell of the foster mother. And the young begged more for their birth mother smell than their foster mother smell. And then finally, of course, um, it's not just about smelling our parents, but smelling our mates. And if you are a bird that lives in a large colony, um, like an auklet or a penguin, then smell may be very important for finding your way back to your nest, to your mate, um, making really critical choices about your social lives. And this makes sense. I'm, it's not really that surprising for auklets or penguins. But what is surprising is that they're finding that even birds like dark-eyed juncos have individually um, specific scent profiles. So the preen oil gland uh, contains bacteria and the bacteria work with the oil to create different volatile chemicals. It turns out that juncos, each junco has an individual scent profile. So the proportion of different volatile chemicals varies from individual to individual. And um, that these chemicals are used by juncos, but this research is still ongoing and um, it remains to be seen how important those individually specific scent profiles are to juncos. But a bit of a surprise that even a songbird might have individualized odor. So I want to stop now because I've been talking for almost an hour. <laughs> and um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about the mystery senses because those are great, but maybe another time. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Dr. Maybe. And I don't know if you want to stop sharing and we can see everybody then. Yeah, I'll do that. There we go. Wonderful. Um, if anybody has a question, you can either unmute or put it in the chat. I'll keep my eyeballs on the chat. Um, I, I see a question from, from Craig um, about the citrusy odor. And I actually don't know why. 
there are some volatile chemicals that um, are kind of common and, and it may not, so how we perceive that smell, of course, is probably not how an auklet exactly perceives that smell. So um, I would just, well, I don't know, but I would say, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to go find out, see if I can find out if there's anything about that particular set of volatile chemicals that is important to auklets or related to their food source, something. I do see another uh, chat uh, question. Um, is it true that birds can tell when berries are ripe because of the UV light from the berries? Yes, there's, uh, there's some research that supports that idea. And we don't know how widespread that is, but that goes to the food choice question and the use of UV in food choice. No, I and found it interesting about the uh, bacteria in the preen gland or the oils from the preen gland of the songbirds because there's a lot more to those glands than just keeping the feathers in good shape. There's there's a lot of stuff going on there, producing vitamins. Yes. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, wow. <laughs> I keep trying to get one of my students interested in studying preening. I've been fascinated by preening for decades. It's such, it seems like such a boring behavior, but it's really important. And feather condition is extremely important, especially for migratory birds. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There are several thank yous coming in. They learned so much. Thank you. We well, all thank you. <laughs> I thank you again. I, I literally, I know it's nine o'clock, but now that I've gotten going, I could just keep going. <laughs> so I appreciate you all for sitting with me and um, letting me share my enthusiasm. So we, we appreciate it and uh, keep up the good work with the students at Hiram. Um, Thank you. Get them out for those bird walks. How about that? Yes. I hope I'll be in the UK during those bird walks, most of them. But um, I will encourage students who are not with me in the UK to show oh, up okay. for those bird walks. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. All right. Any other questions, anyone? All righty. I'm just going to mention, you know, again, check our, out the website. Uh, we've got we get a lot of field trips. We've got programs going on, um, meetups, uh, just you know, buy some coffee, that type of thing. So again, have a good evening. Thank you. Everybody be safe from the winter weather that's coming up and uh, watch those birds and, and just wonder, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? What are they smelling? What are they tasting? You know, uh, yeah. we didn't even touch on the sense of taste. And I know my chickens can taste things. <laughs> they like stuff and they don't like stuff. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have Good a night, day. everyone. Good Thank night. you. Bye.